In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Nativity of Our Lord Jesus Christ. The 25th day of December, when ages beyond number had run their course from the creation of the world, when God in the beginning created heaven and earth and formed man in his own likeness, when century upon century had passed since the Almighty set his bow in the clouds after the great flood as a sign of covenant and peace, in the 21st century since Abraham, our father in faith came out of Ur of the Chaldees. In the 13th century, since the people of Israel, Israel were led by Moses in the exodus from Egypt. Around the thousandth year since David was anointed king. In the 65th week of the prophecy of Daniel, in the 194th Olympiad. In the year 752 since the foundation of the city of Rome, in the 42nd year of the reign of Caesar Octavian Augustus, the whole world being at peace, Jesus Christ, eternal God and Son of eternal Father, desiring to consecrate the world by his most loving presence, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and when nine months had passed since his conception, was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of Judea, and was made man. The Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ according to the flesh.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, you made this holy night shine with the brightness of the true light. Grant that here on earth we may walk in the light of Jesus' presence, and in the last day wake to the brightness of his glory. Through your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading from Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fire, as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulder and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Titus. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. 
training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the great and in the present age, to the lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Chirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Alright, that sounded like some exuberance, that's good. I love worship on Christmas Eve, it was actually kind of funny, I was, uh, and I always hate to call them, like talk about my family when I don't warn them ahead of time, but uh, uh, Matt and I were just having a conversation, he's like, Dad, do you really like going to work on Christmas? And it's like, yeah, of course. Of course I love going to Christmas worship. Now I know that sounds like a self- evident thing for a pastor to say. I mean, if I didn't like it, I'd probably be in the wrong vocation, right? Um, but yeah, there's something about service on Christmas Eve that has always just just drawn me in, just even from being a child until now. And um, I, I know that, uh, you, you know, it seemed in, in 2020 when we couldn't have in-person Christmas service, it, I was like walking around my house unsure of what I was supposed to be doing because I thought I was supposed to be here. And so it's with a lot of joy that we get to share Christmas tidings tonight. And um, we actually have some from overseas. I, uh, we received a gift, actually, from our sister congregation in Augsburg. And I know that you probably can't see this real well, but uh, um, 
this, this little carved and uh, uh, ornament and it's hand painted and came from one of the Christmas markets there. And uh, they sent us a card and wanted us to share with everyone. It says, Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we all here at your partner congregation in Augsburg, Alfred de Hongas Kirche, uh, I think I said that right, wish you a blessed and merry Christmas and a happy new year. May the light that the birth of our Savior and brother Jesus Christ brought in this dark world light up your lives at St. Luke and bring you hope and happiness in this time of year. All the best, Pastor Mona. She is the new pastor there at the church. Pastor Benjamin, who many of you have met, who's been here with us before, has moved on to his next call. But uh, we're certainly grateful for that gift and that they remembered us. And of course, you know, we sent them uh, handmade Christmas to go on their Christmas tree this year. And so um, it's always nice to hear from our church. And it reminds us that, you know, our faith is not something that's just local. It's not something that just takes place here. It connects us with people who in all of these different times and places are doing much the same thing that we're doing on this night. And so we're grateful for that connection. But you know, one of the more interesting things to happen to me so far this holiday season was a conversation with Santa. Now, b before you think I've finally lost my mind, because I know in the years I've said some really odd stuff from the pulpit, how I haven't gotten run off yet, I'm not sure. But I, I haven't lost my mind. I want you to hear me out. I, I spent uh, some time uh, several weeks back trying to uh, get a Santa Claus to come for our Christmas craft fair. And, and this is trickier than you might think. Um, I don't know why I found this surprising, but December is apparently a really busy time for Santa. And so um, it was hard to find, uh, find a time for Santa to be here. So um, I finally got in touch with, this, uh, with Santa Rick. And uh, Santa Rick is an agent that makes sure that Santa is where he needs to be on certain days. And so... Um, we spent a few minutes discussing the nature of what we had going on here at the church and how we wanted to have Santa come and take some pictures. And um, so we, we talked about that, and we, we talked about his fee, which, by the way, I, I know that you probably don't know this, but, but Santa isn't free uh, when he makes public appearances. I mean, you gotta, you got to pay the elves somehow, right? So um, <clears throat> we talked for a few minutes about this business sort of stuff, and then um, he, he asked me this uh, he asked me this kind of heavy question. He was like, hey, Pastor Rob, do you ever feel like the world's gone a little crazy? Now, let me tell you, nothing in my seminary training indicated that at any point in my career that I would be having a conversation with Santa Claus about the state that the world is in. Now, if somebody had told seven-year-old me that, I probably would have spontaneously combusted just from the excitement of the prospect. But we talked, and, you know, Santa had some good points. Been, been around a lot of years, seen a thing or two, and he's seen how it feels like society and culture has shifted a little bit. It's the, this, this decrease in some of our civility and some of our kindness to one another, uh, a lack of understanding that the humanity that, that we have is a shared humanity, that we're, we really all are connected to one another in ways that maybe we don't yet understand. And we talked about this for probably another good 40 minutes or so on the phone. It was, it was all a little surreal. And at the end of that conversation, we agreed that, you know, this world is both wonderfully beautiful and madden, maddening, maddeningly imperfect. It's beautiful, but it's imperfect. And that each of us had our own role to play and trying to, in our own way, remind folks that we need to have hearts that are open. Hearts that are open to God and hearts that are open to one another. It's true, though, the world really does sometimes seem far beyond our control or even our influence. It, and it feels like there are daily reminders of that reality. Uh, you know, five minutes of watching the news and, and you're hearing about wars and crime and the economy and political strife and there are seemingly infinite instances at any given moment of things that we simply don't get to control. No matter how much we wish 
we could do that. It's a reminder that at the end of the day, the world really is an imperfect place. But the question is, how do we respond to that? Well, I think a lot of us respond to that fact by trying to control as much as we can. We try to control those things that we think are in our immediate sphere of influence. And so we try hard to maybe have a sense of control over our jobs or our careers, or maybe within our personal lives, or maybe within our family relationships. One of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of people try and exert this weird sense of control over Christmas. Have you noticed that? Even if the world around us is going crazy, if it's imperfect, we can at least make Christmas perfect, right? We can go and find that perfect Christmas tree and we can decorate it just right. We can go and, and shop and find that perfect Christmas gift for our loved ones, and we can even imagine the joy that's going to wash over their face when they open it up and say, oh, it's what I've always wanted. We can plan that perfect Christmas dinner knowing that everyone will enjoy a sumptuous meal so much that it's going to be the talk of the family reunion in spring. It reminds me of a scene in that great epic of truth, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. You probably know the one. You've seen this movie, right? I mean, we've, AMC plays it like 900 times during the Christmas season. But it's that scene where Clark and Ellen Griswold, they're actually lying in bed the night before everybody's supposed to start arriving at their house for Christmas, and um, Ellen is really worried about the stress that will inevitably come when everybody shows up at the house. But Clark, he's determined, right? He is going to have his Christmas. He says, Ellen, I want to have Christmas here in our house. It means a lot to me. All of my life, I've wanted this big family Christmas. And she responds by saying, it's just that I know how you build things up in your head, Sparky. You set standards that no family event can ever live up to. And if you've seen the movie, you know that everything that can go wrong does go wrong, including ending with a SWAT team invading their house. I, I, at least my, uh, we've had some crazy Christmases, but I don't think we've had a SWAT team yet. But that movie, it, it tells this, it tells the truth. It does, it, it's no matter how hard we try to make things perfect, we know that our trees might have a crooked star. It's a little straighter than it was. Or that perfect gift, you know, the one that you shopped so hard for, that you thought about it so much? Guess where that thing's going December 26th? That's when people ask for the receipt to take it back, right? Or that Christmas meal will leave everyone wishing that you had just ordered from Cracker Barrel in one of those pick-up-and-heat dinners. That's not to say anything of anyone's behavior. Our Christmas celebrations are a lot like the world. They're beautiful in their own way, but they're, they're imperfect. They really are. But this world, this wonderfully beautiful and imperfect creation, is the world that Jesus came to. It's this one. It's not some idealized place. The circumstances of his birth were a far cry from the tranquil and ideal Christmas that we somehow have imagined and put into Christmas pageants. And they're even further from the ones that we try and create for ourselves and our families. I mean, that first Christmas is really, it's a, it's a very human story, putting aside a lot of the theology at the, the, that comes in with it. But really, at, at its heart, it's a story about a man and a woman swept up in circumstances beyond their control, trying to fulfill a mandate at an incredibly inopportune time. It's a story about a family trying to seek shelter wherever they can find it, about a child being born into imperfect circumstances and parents trying to make the best of the situation. And yes, it's a story about angels that come and sing praises 
to this newborn king who has been enthroned in a feed trough. His royal robe, strips of cloth tied together to keep him warm. And he's not greeted by royal attendants, but by shepherds. Just your average working Joe who showed up to pay homage. And it seems like an inauspicious start for the one whom we have spent the last 2,000 years worshiping. But you know, even in its imperfection, this world is without a doubt a world that God loves. And those imperfect people in our lives and our own imperfections, those are the people that God loves himself. God loves so much that he was willing to take on our humanity to live and to die as we do so that we can find reconciliation with the divine and with one another. Reminds me of something that the great Methodist missionary E. Stanley Jones wrote. Jones pointed out at one time, he said, the early Christians did not say in dismay, look at what the world has come to. But in delight, look at what has come to our world. So as we gather here tonight to pray and to sing, let us turn our focus to what or really who has come. Because it's here and now, and it's in the here and now of this life, and all of its messiness and all of its complication that we find God. We don't need to wait for a perfect time or a perfect place or circumstance to find Jesus in this world. We don't even need to be perfect ourselves, something we know we can never be. Because the story of Christmas is really about Jesus seeking us out wherever we are in our lives with a promise of grace and peace which exceeds our own understanding. And he does that tonight and every night. That promise to come to us in our weakness, to come to us in our imperfection, those are the glad tidings of comfort and joy that we came to sing about tonight. May that grace and peace be yours this night and every night forward. Amen.
Let us profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With longing and hopeful expectation, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Fill the church with your spirit that it may be a messenger of peace and goodwill. Bless our presiding Bishop Elizabeth, our Bishop Kevin, our Pastor Rob, and all who have been called to lead your church in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Anoint the leaders of nations to protect and care for those who are vulnerable, weak, poor, and oppressed. Bring an end to war, armed conflict, and violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shelter all those who are hungry and, hungry and homeless. Grant shelter to those who are in need during this time of bitter cold. Strengthen all those who are perplexed or afraid and comfort all who are grieving or ill, especially all on our prayer list and all we name now silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Draw near to all those who will travel or welcome others this week who are expecting a child or struggling with infertility and who face the holidays with eagerness or anxiety. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Joseph, the angels, and the shepherds, we ponder the mystery of your grace and give thanks for those who have gone before us in the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our prayers, faithful God, as we watch and wait for your coming among us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the wonder and mystery of the Word made flesh, you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory, that beholding the God made visible, we may be drawn to love the God whom we cannot see, and so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join our unending hymn. Glory to you, Lord God, heavenly King. In the beginning you created the world through him who is the word made flesh. In remembering your promises to Israel that from the root of Jesse a new shepherd would come, at the appointed time the archangel Gabriel visited the blessed Virgin Mary, and by the Spirit's power your son was conceived. Born in humble surroundings, our Lord Jesus became Emmanuel, God with us, God born for us, God in the midst of us. Thus we praise you for your goodness and laud your magnificent love, a love which would lead this child to become the man for others, the one who takes away all fears, doubts, and helplessness, the one who in love bore the Holy Cross. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me.
we join our voices with the angels and all the heavenly, heavenly choir. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to you, Lord God, heavenly King. In this child, all lives are renewed and all sins are forgiven by his life and holy passion, his resurrection and exaltation at your right hand. By that spirit which gave our Lord life as an infant, empowered his ministry of words and miracles, and raised him at his resurrection, bless now this bread of heaven and cup of blessing, that as we eat and drink of our Lord's body and blood, we may be filled with your forgiving love and the promise of new life through this holy child. Glory to you, Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory and do and praise forevermore. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have beheld his glory. Make yourself known to us in the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup.
Please stand. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Blessed are you, Prince of Peace. You rule the earth with truth and justice. Send your gift of peace to all nations of the world. Blessed are you, Wonderful Counselor. You enlighten the heart with steadfast love. Enliven your church that it may bear good tidings of great joy to all people. Blessed are you, Emmanuel. You promise to be with us even unto the end of the age. Open our eyes to see your presence in all who are hungry, lonely, or homeless. Blessed are you, Son of Mary. You share our humanity. Have mercy on the sick, the dying, and all who suffer this day. Blessed are you, Son of God. You dwell among us as the Word made flesh. Reveal yourself to us in word and sacrament that we may bear your light to all the world. May you be filled with the wonder of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the Magi, and the peace of the Christ child. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen.
Let us go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.